And I think the United States and maybe other international donors need to kind of look at the Mahala, which is not totally independent. It's a quasi-governmental mm -hmm, kind mm -hmm, of organization. Mm -hmm but as an organization which might be able to step into some of those critical civil society functions that are going to be necessary going forward. Mm -hmm. And parallel to those mahalas are the bloggers who have formed communities around them. They're the ones who are pushing for local solutions to, to local issues and uh, many civil society experts we have talked to, including in the West, they say that we should stop analyzing civil society from that perspective. Like the civil society isn't just human rights activists. Right. Civil society is broader for Uzbekistan. And yet we don't really see much being discussed here. And when we engage the bloggers in those communities, some of them are basically saying, let's not have the discussions, let's not discuss the nature of our work, let's discuss the issues that we're fighting for. So there is that uh, conclusion or belief, strong belief that our work should show why we matter. Like maybe just coining us as a civil society isn't something very helpful. And there they say that maybe the West isn't helping either by saying that we have to have independent organizations, maybe we don't have to be organized. Yeah, and the same applies, for, you know, I think what you're alluding to is, for example, we have a model for how we traditionally see mm -hmm, civil society mm -hmm. NGOs. We have a model for how we traditionally see media, right. you know, as kind of traditional media organizations. And what we're seeing here in Uzbekistan, I think, is some kind of experimentation, but also, you know, growing out of the indigenous experience here, models that don't conform to the, you know, what we traditionally are, expect to see. And so those can be bloggers or influencers who are working independently and are not, I think, by any stretch of the imagined traditional media organizations mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. or mahalas and other groups. So I think, um, you know, I think we need to be open to the fact that Uzbekistan is going to develop democracy in its own way. And uh, if we are, are truthful in our desire to support that democratic development, we shouldn't be trying to impose the model from the outside. We should be working with uh, the individuals and the organizations that are already here in Uzbekistan. And what we have also seen, especially what became quite evident in the last three, four years, is how corrupt the media environment is. And bloggers and journalists, of course, and press officers, they all form that community. <coughs> Here in Uzbekistan, you cannot separate them from each other because journalists can be bloggers, they can also be serving as press secretaries, mm. they can be doing somebody's uh, public relations work. And in this environment, you know, we want to discuss the conflicts of interest, we want to discuss the fight against corruption, whereas the, the community itself seems to be quite mixed, various players who, whose work could be creating major conflicts of interest. And it's very interesting because, as you know, our agency just held some trainings uh, on solutions journalism in Uzbekistan, and we had that opportunity to discuss this with um, journalists and bloggers who tell us that maybe what we are doing is teaching them this polite, very ethical journalism without going deeper into the media environment in Uzbekistan. Maybe they say, they argue that uh, these grants, these uh, media assistance should really support that community as is because they believe that uh, they, can do they can be journalists and bloggers at the same time. They can be activists at the same time. Mm. Maybe we shouldn't be teaching them the, this global, traditional journalistic, at least promoting those values and expecting them to, to follow. Uh, and the government likes the sound of that. They say, yeah, that's good because let's create our own journalism, you know, not U.S. influenced journalism or Western based on Western values, but Uzbek journalism, where we shouldn't really focus on conflicts of interest, but what we are bringing in as a content. I mean, I do think Uzbekistan should develop journalism in its own way, uh, but I think there are some, still some universal truths, just like there are some universal basic human rights, um, and one of those is that. You know, there, there needs to be a separation, for example, between opinion and factual reporting. This is why, you know, traditional media organizations are trained to clearly label things that are opinion and things that aren't. Or things that, for example, are paid, you know, uh, paid uh, pieces of journalism. You know, I, I think the consumers of that have the right to know when they're reading something, whether it's been paid for by, for example, by the government or by a company, uh, or whether something is just the opinion of a uh, uh, an opinion rather rather than you know something that meets kind of you know journalistic standards so and there can be conflicts of interest i think that are really problematic 
So I'd say we need to be careful about saying, you know, like, you know, anything goes. Uh, I think there are some basic things, but it doesn't have to look exactly like a Western media organization. As long as, you know, we're not kind of crossing any of these red lines that lead to, you know, corruption and conflicts of interest. Mm -hmm. So when you say um, the United States supports the media freedom, supports the media development of Uzbekistan, what do you mean? What kind of journalists and bloggers do you support? So we mean a lot of things when we say that. One of them is just morally, you know, that we support uh, independent media and the media freedom. Uh, and we will advocate, you know, with uh, both publicly and privately with the government, you know, for that. We think that's actually something that, you know, the government of Uzbekistan wants. And pres the president himself has spoken on a number of occasions Multiple about times. the critical role of media. Um, in addition, we pro have programs that support media. Some of those are uh, targeted at individual journalists to give them you know, an opportunity for professional development, give them, for example, opportunities to go to the United States and develop professional contacts there. Uh, and then we have more general assistance that can be provided to institutions. Um, those programs are fairly small right now in Uzbekistan. Um, and really are kind of designed, you know, for what I was saying before that to try to, you know, increase professionalism, teach, you know, some of these basic ethic things. But I'm open to the idea that we need to be a little more flexible with that last category. And for example, be more inclusive of bloggers and influencers, um, you know, and to provide them maybe uh, more tools, uh, more expertise to be able to kind of generate their own revenue, uh, to be able to support their activities. Um, but in the end, uh, everybody should be obeying the law. Uh, journalists are not exempt from the law, you know, neither, you know, neither are government officials. And so I, I think when it comes to conflicts of interest and corruption, you know, we do need to be careful there. The constant criticism about the U.S. Embassy, at least in Tashkent, is that you support the liberal voices only. So you don't care about the, the Muslim bloggers or huh. conservatives or even pro-governments. You know, they say, okay, if I'm, if I'm pushing for the government's policies, if I'm supporting Mirziyoyev, then the U.S. Embassy doesn't care about me. We've heard that in, in various conversations. And I know that you're on a regular basis quoted by the Uzbek media. So it's not like the Uzbek society doesn't hear from you. But the, those who are not part of the programs that you do or engagements that you hold complain about that. Thank you for, for sharing the criticism. It's actually not our intent to, to be focusing only on you know, a particular Liberal part of the, yeah, of the ideological spectrum. Um, you know, when it comes to example for media freedom, we are very heavily engaged with the more devout parts of you know, Uzbek society because we believe freedom of religion is not simply about like minority religions here. Right. It's about the majority religion as well. The rights of you know Uzbek Muslims to be able to practice their faith. Um, when it comes to you know uh, journalists having you know doing reporting that's pro-government, why would we have a problem with that? I mean, most of our agenda here is to support the government's you know reform efforts. So um, if if that's the impression, then you know maybe we need to do a better <laughs> job of reaching out to, to those groups and make sure that they feel included as well. So they also see these critics, some of them at least, um, and including your critics in the government, um, see you as, um, as an avid supporter of religious freedom and an avid supporter of the LGBTQ plus rights. And that creates resentment. They say that you've been so fixated on these two things that uh, it's become harder for them to talk with you on other issues. Is there a question there? Yeah. So how do you react to that? So we support um, everybody's human rights. And we don't think that any individual, no matter who they are, have special rights. Everybody has the same basic human rights. Everybody, I believe, I believe this both personally and, I, and it is my professional kind of job to do this. I believe everybody has the right to be free from violence. Everybody has the right to, you know, to have a job, to, to go to school. Um, we're not suggesting that any particular group should have special rights that aren't enjoyed by everybody else. Uh, so I challenge the idea that, like, you know, we're focusing on, you know, particular groups. Now, there may be um, particular groups that have more trouble accessing the same rights as everybody else in Uzbek society. And, you know, and therefore, obviously, they're going to get a little bit more attention. Uh, so as far as religious freedom, I will say that... Um, it is a matter of U.S. government policy to support religious freedom around the world. 
Uh, we were, for example, and that, when we do that, I want to be very clear that we're not supporting Christianity, we're not just supporting Judaism, we're supporting all religious freedom. Uh, you know, it, it, a couple of years ago, we were, uh, I think, among the leading advocates for a, a Shia group mm -hmm. here in Uzbekistan to be able to register uh, a second mosque. You know, and they got it. And they were able to do it. And it's a testament to, uh, frankly, Uzbekistan's religious tolerance that these groups that maybe do not reflect the majority of the, you know, the, the faithful here um, are able to practice freely. And Uzbekistan is justifiably proud, I should be proud, of having a history of religious tolerance. Um, but uh, at the same time, you know, we have to do our, we're congressionally mandated to do a religious freedom report every year where we report on the issues of religious freedom in the country. And that can be, you know, registering of churches or mosques. It can be, you know, issues of, uh, you know, being able to, you know, freely pray, uh, being able to, you know, what, go to mosque or whatever it is. And so, you know, we do our best to be objective about the situation here. We talk to, uh, you know, the religious communities and hear from them their concerns. And in the, at the end of the day, I, it, it pains me to think that this might cause tension with the government here because we're simply you know, trying to help the government you know, live up to its own uh, standards of being a, you know, a country that is religiously tolerant. And uh, your position on the LGBTQ plus uh, rights? Again, I said, you know, we support you know, the human rights of all individuals. And where, where do you stand in your dialogue with the Uzbek government on that? Because the response, as far as we know from here, is that we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to discuss it. We don't want to talk about it. We don't even want to deal with that issue. We don't have an issue uh, with that, they say, including people like Akmal Saidov and others, the, the human rights faces of Uzbekistan. And also, then there are some other voices who say that we have to first protect or ensure the rights of the majority in Uzbekistan. Why are we even talking about these tiny groups of people, whereas the majority of Uzbekistan still has trouble uh, enjoying their rights? Uh, I mean, I, I think it's a fallacy to say, you know, that you, you, know, you have to support the rights of one group over another group. I think, you know, that democratic societies uh, have, I think, an obligation, and Uzbekistan, Uzbekistan included. Uzbekistan is a signatory to the same uh, international, you know, treaties that uh, the United States is in terms of promising to respect basic human rights, that they will guarantee the rights of all their citizens. In general, you raise these issues when there are cases, right? They are, ca they are, they are case-related uh, conversations that you have. It's not like, in general, you're, you have a program to do this in Uzbekistan. Uh, I mean, I, you know, my public statements speak for themselves. Uh, again, I, I, we support the rights of all individuals here. And we know that the, the, the support of the LGBTQ plus community is uh, also uh, President Biden's priority, is one of his priorities. So that priority is also applying to Central Asia, right? So it's not like you're not just raising the issue, issue specifically in Uzbekistan. There's there is a regional... There's absolutely nothing we're doing here in Uzbekistan that we're not doing worldwide. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the worldwide policy promotion. Uh, again, Navahar, we're talking about every individual should have the same, enjoy the same rights. You know, they, whether it's, you know, again, the right to, to, you know, to enjoy freedom of religion, the right to free speech, the right to be free from violence. I, I think we can agree that these are things that everybody should enjoy, right? No matter, no matter who they are. And this approach by the United States will not change even when the presidents uh, change, when the leadership changes in Washington. This is an ongoing effort. So, I mean, I, having worked for both Republican and Democratic administrations, I see a lot of consistency in terms of our broad policy, mm -hmm. in terms of support for human rights. Uh, emphasis can change depending on the administra you know, on the administration, you know, which where they want to focus efforts. And so I can't speak to uh, what the next administration might choose to emphasize. But broadly speaking, I think um, I've worked on Central Asia, as you know, for some time. And uh, I've seen a lot of consistency in terms of our policy here, our support for Uzbekistan's independence, sovereignty, territorial integrity, our supports for the, you know, the, the regional uh, cooperation and integration. Um, and I think, I think I can confidently say, having worked in the last few administrations, that 
regardless of who wins our elections coming up in November, that you can expect that our policy to, towards Uzbekistan will, will remain, remain consistent.